Welcome to Startup Different. I'm Dave, your Chief Podcast Officer. With me is my brother and podcast sidekick, Chris. We're two successful entrepreneurs paying it forward by debunking startup myths, tackling the toughest challenges, and giving you the tools to build your business. Today, we're talking about how you can come up with your next great business idea. Let's dig in. Hello, folks, and welcome to episode one. We've done it. We've crossed the bridge from zero to one. Hopefully you enjoyed our episode zero. It was actually a, considered a trailer, we la later learned, uh, thanks to the good folks at uh, Spotify. And uh, hopefully you got a good idea of what we're trying to do here today. Well, and, and actually we're gonna kick things off with a discussion um, basically on ideation. And that is how to come up with you know good ideas for your business. And it's, it's pretty hard. Yeah, it's easy, right? Everybody's doing it. <laughs> Have you ever done that before, Chris? <laughs> uh, a couple of times. Uh, it can be incredibly frustrating, but uh, yeah. yeah, you know, the, sometimes they come when you're not expecting. Sometimes they you know, take a lot of work. <laughs> I, despite being a podcaster, I listen to many podcasts and it is fun to hear on other shows where big ideas come from, but I actually always enjoy uh, the process and you hear about, you know, and for some people it is kind of some luck for sure, you know, just being in the right place at the right time. To some extent, I actually think we benefited a little bit from that. But, um, you know, it, it is amazing the, the variety you'll see. Most of the I, time, though, it's an arduous, difficult process. So um, I would almost say sometimes it doesn't happen without luck. Like yeah, luck is required. That's you true. Know? Yeah. yeah. How do you I define think it's a luck? Big part. Yeah. I think a big part of it is like, you know, again, I think we might have mentioned it even in the, in the trailer there. But, you know, like your return on luck, right? You, you want to be in a position to be lucky. Think a lot about the good to great stuff um, uh, in that book, which is fantastic, by the way. But um, keep in mind, though, that luck is defined as the convergence of preparation and opportunity. By who? Right? who is that your definition? I don't know. Probably Winston <laughs> Churchill or something. Well, I like it. I, I like it. Convergence <laughs> and opportunity. That's what we're doing here. That's why we started the podcast. But anyway, uh, let's get into this and let's talk about um, how we want to do this. So, and, and I'll actually just say at the outset, too, we have a blog post on this. It's going to kind of give you the high level of our discussion today. You can check it out at startupdifferent.com. And uh, we're going to basically get into six different principles, but there's a couple of things um, we want to just sort of tackle right on. And, you know, one of the reasons we're doing the podcast too is there's just so much BS in the startup world. And there's all these like myths about, you know, X, Y, or Z. And, and, and even in ideation, the, like you're not even really, a, you're not a business yet. You're just trying to think of an idea for one. There's already a myth to address. Um, and that is the Eureka myth. Okay. And, uh, you're, you, you, it's probably explained in different ways in different places, but it's really that you're going to have this aha moment, you know, that you're going to walk outside and you're going to trip, you're going to hit your head and all of a sudden, ah, great idea. Are you going to sleep in the middle of the night? You're going to have a, an awesome dream, wake up, write it down on a notepad and you're going to, you know, fire up a business from that. And so this is kind of like this, this fallacy, this is not going to happen. This is a deliberate, difficult, taxing emotionally and physically process. Uh, to do this. And when, when you say, Chris. Yeah, I would agree. Um, yeah. The, when, when you're thinking about these ideas, you have to be someplace where it's going to happen. Uh, you know, I, I can't, there's a ton of friends that I have that all said, Oh, I want to start a business, but I just don't have an idea. And you've got to put yourself out there, uh, to put yourself in a position where some problem is going to cross your path and you're going to say, Hey, I've, I know how to write code or I knew how I know something about engineering or yeah. I know something about, I don't know, roofing tiles and I can fix this problem. And it, that, that's really where it comes well, from. I, you know, I always think, in, and in our early days in particular, I mean, Chris used to do a lot of custom code projects. So you'd have people coming up to you with ideas all the time. Oh, yeah. And uh, I think we, we used to make this joke that, you know, people will be pitching us on Twitter, but you pay for it. But yeah. I think you actually pay for Twitter now. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that joke went away now because you actually, I think, do pay for Twitter now or X or whatever. Or whatever the hell it's called. It. It's, it's not yeah. a bird anymore still. Um, yeah. But at any rate, so um, so just understand right now, this is going to be a process. And and you maybe you've already been trying to come up with some ideas. Maybe you already have some. Maybe they're okay or whatever. And you're trying to validate. These are things we're going to address here today. So there's six big principles um, that we want to that we want to focus on. And I think the, uh, I'm, I'm going to take the first one here and then I, well, Chris is going to roll into the second one for sure, because I think it's his, his real uh, strength. But the first thing is that um, you basically, you need to chill out. 
And this is kind of counterintuitive, you know, some people like, I know a lot of type A's and like they're, they have a lot of intensity when they're trying to do something new and whatever. And, uh, and then you're, you're trying to get into new ideas and you're stressing yourself out because you're thinking, man, I can't think of anything good or everything you think of has already been thought of, or, um, you know, there's just, there's no space there. Or you're not sure there's a market or what, you know, all these things that can stress you out about it. And the research on this is that actually the more stressed out you are, the less likely uh, you are to frankly come up with an idea. Like in, in essence, it's, you're less creative with more more cortisol uh, in your blood. And so uh, there's actually some really interesting research on this, that everything from you know, obviously being less stressed, but even to like going outside more and hanging out with more people and even dimming the lights in your house can help you be uh, more creative. So an actual like fundamental thing here is that when you're considering idea generation, just chill. You, it's going to be difficult. You need to understand it's going to be difficult. You need to understand you're going to have these feelings and that that's okay and do your best to work through them. And I might, I can almost like feel you hearing that right now and going like, is this guy really telling me to chill out? Like that's, that's what we're leading with an idea generation. Well, yeah, because it's actually tied to every other principle that we're going to talk about here today. You need to be relaxed. You need to be in a good place uh, to come up with these ideas. And you know, I actually, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to go on some vacations on occasion. And I, I find that they definitely hits. Like I want to learn more languages when I'm away. I'm reading more when I'm away. I'm interested. I have different thoughts on vacation. And I really think that's all about this reduction of cortisol uh, in my blood. Does that sound, does that even make any sense to you, Chris? Does that add up? Or yeah. I, I'm super low stress, all this <laughs> coffee that I drink and I never take a vacation and <laughs> <Delicious>. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, I mean, wouldn't you, Chris was on like 24 hour support for our, for his various businesses. And then obviously app armor, our main business, I think for like what, like 15 years consecutively. So yeah, yeah. I think you're Mr. High stress a little I bit. I was just sweating cortisol <laughs> <laughs> at all times. Um, yeah. So after that, I think the, the, the next key principle that we're looking at is, um, you want a lot of ideas. And, uh, so yep. when I finished school, when I finished uh, my MBA program, I was like totally fired up with like all these business ideas and tried a bunch of weird stuff. Um, and we kind of knew that we, we, there's a bit of a pattern you kind of you know you have the idea um i found that the longer i waited the less i wanted to do it so i tried to have the idea and immediately get onto it and do something about it um uh, sometimes that was writing some code sometimes that was that was just like buying a domain name or something like that and kind of kind of get the creative juices flowing um and so we, we tried a bunch of different ideas uh and really jumped on them quickly and tried to get something a minimum viable product in the, in the place and uh and go from there so i don't know dave how many do we have that kind of flopped at one point or another well, before uh, well i have two thoughts one is we'll get go deep on minimum viable products and lean startup in another episode because i think that's an awesome um, an awesome topic and has it, it, everybody throws around MVP and I think we should add some structure there, but we'll get to that later. But then in terms of number of businesses or like I, not even business ideas that we were had and that we were sort of testing, uh, we probably had four or five on the go. Um, you know, I, yeah. I think when an app armor being one of them along with uh, a few other uh, businesses as, uh, as well, which, you know, and what was interesting is like all of them had some level of revenue, you know, and I think what yeah. we were a part of, you know, part of all this, um, and we actually have another blog post on this on our, on our website, sarahdifferent.com is about, you know, just doing it, like going out and trying these ideas is, is going to be obviously a key to success. It's not specifically a principle because it's kind of like implied, but you know, uh, I think that having a lot of ideas is, is as you're suggesting, very important because you don't really know what's going to work. And if you put all your eggs in one basket and it doesn't work out, um, you know, you're going to feel pretty silly. So. Especially for us too, because we were bootstrapping them all. Um, so we, we didn't have funding. We didn't have like one bad idea that we pitched to a VC who somehow <laughs> threw a bunch of money at us. And then we were like, oh, this is actually a terrible idea. But now we got all this money and we told this VC it was going to work. So we got to push through on it. So for us, it, it was push nice to pivot another <laughs> episode that we'll talk about later. But... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. And I think that, yeah, I think that's a really good learning too, though. Like, you know, um, it, it, you want to validate these ideas because you don't want to be caught in that kind of a terrible position where you're like, okay, now you're trying to do something that you don't like or that doesn't work or that you kind of know won't work, but you've got other people believing in it. It's a bizarre circumstance that I think some founders find themselves in. What, what is it with like people come up with an idea and then just won't Google it? Okay, well, that's, already this exists. is it. Chris, you, yeah. you've wandered right into the third principle, which is we have to validate the idea. And it sounds... Yeah. 
hilarious that this is a principle, but some people need to hear this. And the first part of this and the easiest part of validating your idea is for like, for the love of God, Google it. <laughs> Does it yeah. exist? Is it out many... there? Is it in the app store? Is it, is it a physical product? Whatever product it is, is it out there? You know, yeah. is it already happening? And Dave, like how many times did our friends want to have a beer with us about a secret business I, I, idea? Exists. And then yeah. they finally t spit it out while you're having the beer. And then you're like, oh, you Google it real quick. And it's like, oh, that already exists. Like, you know, and that's what a good are you going to do different? And like their argument would be like, well, it's me doing it. Yeah, it's mine. Do it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it's already also, done. It's already built. You know. I, like, I also, just for what it's worth, like, don't get me wrong. Your idea is important and everything, but it's not like top secret level important. If, if like when you're telling other, you should tell other people about it. We're gonna get to that in a second too. But like, yeah. if when somebody comes to me and like somebody you're validating the idea with, like, just tell them really quickly because that's kind of what you're doing there, and it's or, it's probably not a rocket science. Or your buddy wants you to sort of sign like an, an NDA. Oh, it's yeah, so no important. Ideas. I need you to sign an NDA before I'll have a beer with you to talk about yeah. it. Well, give me a, like, I, I, I don't know. Just, like, you know what, maybe there's my chances eyes. we don't understand why that's important, but like 99.99999%. Like, uh, you, you better be you know, going to the nines, moon with this you know? or something to be <laughs> throwing that around for, for the type of uh, startup ideas that we're typically so, working on. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And so then when you Google it, you know, what do you find? Okay. So Googling it is, is, is good enough. So like if the nothing's out there, okay, maybe there's opportunity, but it's not necessarily means that doesn't always mean it's going to work out. The other part to this is like, okay, is there actually a market? So if you Google it and there's nothing, maybe there's a reason, but if you Google it and you find competitors, maybe that's okay. You know, most people go, Oh God, somebody's doing, it. well, it depends, you know, classic, by the way, that's a classic business answer. We're going to hear that all through the, the podcast. It depends. And what's interesting is that, you know, competitors come in different shapes and sizes, as we sort of know, you know, there's, you know, your small time, you know, uh, kind of like trunk slammer, working in the garage kind of idea. You got your venture capital funded startups and you've got kind of like the big guys, you know, more established firms. And, you know, I, understanding that landscape is important. If there's a bunch of hokey pokey websites uh, that are like kind of like loosely put together, it doesn't look like they're that professional. I think there's opportunity there because those people are educating the market for you. So they're actually doing you a favor. They're actually educating the market, you know, if it's like a B2B business, maybe there's, they're educating people to the extent that they're starting to prepare budgets. Like you're getting customers are starting to realize they want money for this kind of an idea. If it's B2C, you know, they're doing some favor for you because you know, your market's more aware of it. And I think then you're considering, okay, this might actually be something we can attack. We can go in. They're not expecting us. We can do this better. You know, better mouse, mouse trap is a good idea. You know, I, I don't think you should back away. You don't have to do something crazy. You don't have to do something super novel, but a, a better mousetrap can make you millions of dollars. So I think it's something to consider there too, is what kind of competitors, if they're venture capital funded, you may have a different kind of advantage over them. Whereas they've already promised somebody who's given them a crap load of money that, you know, they're going to be able to sell the product that amount per customer or whatever. So you can go, you know that, I mean, we used to do this all the time against some of our competitors. We knew they were venture capital funded. We figured out how much they had promised or how much they had sort of argued with VCs that they could get per customer. And we would just make sure we're always underneath that. <laughs> so your next lunch with your VC is going to go terrible yeah, when they it's find be a out tough that conversation. you lost so, a deal and it was half the price of what you had, the, you had v told the, the, the investor. <laughs> and the VCs are, the, those funded firms are intimidating, but they are, you can beat them. You can definitely mm -hmm. beat them. And it's, it's not like as if they're this, um, Goliath. No, they're, they're actually just feeling it out just as much as you are. The difference is they're swimming in debt and they also have some resources. Don't get me wrong. I'm not Mr. Hates funding all the time, but I think the reality is that your advantage in the market is your ability to go in and charge a lot less and, and, and even go to zero if you had to, you know, to really disrupt, uh, their market. Um, so that's kind of an interesting piece too. And then, um, after this, there's kind of like, there's one other really important group uh, that you really want to qualify this with. Um, and, and that's your family. <laughs> and they I always hate it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're going to hate it. Like for, yeah. right off the bat, they're probably going to hate the idea. That's yeah, but dumb, that's good. You know? That's good because yeah. you got to defend it. You got to defend <laughs> the idea. So why is it good? What is your research? And if you come off willy nilly, you're going to know, you're going to know real quick. Your family is going to call you out of that. I have a, a side of my family that's um, you know, more, more Eastern European and they're obviously quite direct. And they will tell me if I'm full of it pretty darn fast. So it's actually very, very helpful in most cases. You know, beware of some of the haters and all that too. You know, there's some element of like, okay, like, but I really believe in this idea. I have good research and I provided a good argument and I know I can do it and I've checked the market and they're still not into it. Okay. Well, you know, maybe, maybe they're not actually working in your best interest. Maybe there's more at play there, but I think at, at least for validating the concept itself, 
um, it's always a good step. And then lastly, Chris, I want you to take this one because I, I think this is really important. And, and this is start, still part of validate the idea, by the way. But um, I want you to take on the fulcrum of innovation because I think yeah. that's, that's your jam. So one of my favorite authors is Seth Godin, and uh, he's the, written a the, bunch the of- The godfather of uh, uh, entrepreneurship. <laughs> incredible author, incredible speaker. I've, I've yeah. seen him speak in person. He's just an incredible guy. Um, one, of, one of my favorite things that uh, he, he I, I don't know if he invented it or not, but it was in one of his books. Um, it was the fulcrum of innovation, which is kind of like this triangle. And if you have like a lever, you need a fulcrum to- kind of pull against to, to make the lever work. And, um, the three points on the le lever were kind of the questions you need to ask yourself if you're going to, uh, start a business. And it's first thing is, is it worth doing? Like, is it helpful? Does it make money? You know, like the next thing is, is it doable? Like, can you actually achieve it? You know, if it's, uh, you know, for me, if it's a software thing, usually I can answer yes to that as long as mm -hmm. it's not too far out of my, my, uh, knowledge base. Um, uh, but, uh, but if it's like way outside of your skill sets, then maybe it's not doable. Um, and then, you know, why you, are you the right person to do it? Uh, and that's a tough one because, you know, you really have to have some knowledge of the market. You need to kind of understand what's going on. It might be a good idea, but you're not the one to do it. Um, you know, I remember there were ideas that friends of ours had that, uh, on how like, you know, a, a cell phone would have like a do not disturb mode, but you could have like exceptions to that. And, yeah. you know, the only people who's going to be able to do that is Apple and Google because the dialer on a, on a mobile phone is kind of like sacred ground that the, the, uh, the, the, the operating systems aren't going to let you change that. So, um, you know, that, that's the kind of thing that you want to ask yourself is like, Hey, it, am I the right person to do this or is, should this be done by somebody else? Yeah. I think also that kind of tiptoes into the territory of like an innovator's dilemma when they talk about sustainable innovations versus disruptive innovation. So like a sustainable innovation is like something a big company could easily replicate. So let's say that example you just had, Chris, you you know, you add a, let's say you made an app that made it so you could do a do not disturb function. And let's pretend that Apple and Google don't have that yet. And, you know, so you put all this time and effort into it. And then six months later, Apple and Google release it and you're out of business. So, I mean, that's an example of where, you know, you don't want to be doing sustainable innovations because um, that's not the right, on the third question of the fulcrum of innovation, why you, it's not you, that's not, you're not the right person to be doing that. You're not no. the right company, not anything. Um, and so that's something to really consider about this too. What you're looking for is kind of like a buzzwordy, but also somewhat accurate term of disruptive innovation. You know, um, think of net Netflix versus Blockbuster, right? You know, like that's that's disruptive. Like Blockbuster couldn't suddenly change. For those folks who remember what Blockbuster was, you know, they couldn't change from, you know, like a physical like shelf, you know, get your movie here to you know directly streaming into your home. They just they just weren't built that way. Um, and they, and I, they I don't even think them. they could do the original Netflix business model, which was like mailing out. DVDs. Yeah, mailing it either. That's true, actually. Right. Like I I think you know there there's some big challenges there for a legacy company like that to be able to really change how they're operating. So for your idea's sake, though, consider what if it's a sustainable innovation or. Um, if it's a uh, disruptive innovation. And that's uh, Innovator's Dilemma by Clayton M. Christensen. It was an awesome book as well. So strongly recommend. So then our fourth principle um, is, uh, so do you understand the problem? And this, well, how is this different from fulcrum innovation? So this is kind of important to understand. So again, fulcrum of innovation, worth doing? Is it doable? And why you? In this case though, it's like, okay, let's assume it's worth doing. Let's assume it is doable. And let's assume that you maybe have some expertise in this area. This is the, this is the key. Like, do you actually uniquely understand the problem that your software or that your product or that your service or whatever it is that you're offering, do you actually understand how to solve that problem? Or do you just know that that, that could be a problem and you're trying to build around it? Like, for example, um, you know, it's, it's not really a question of, of smarts. You need to like intuitively get it. Now, Chris and I, with our business app armor, we didn't uh, understand the unique circumstances of of campus safety uh, on right. a university or college campus. We did understand technology though. We did know how to build mobile, and by we, I mean Chris, but we understood how to build these things and how to go into those markets. And we worked really closely with those customers. We learned with them. And then we gradually over time understood that problem. You're ahead of the game. If you're in something, you know, your current job, you know, you're sitting there, you're listening to something, you're, there's something, something really bugs you all the time. It's something about your job you just can't stand. Um, and it's not like your boss or something like that. It's like something <laughs> like in your day to day, that might be an opportunity because you're feeling that pain. You understand that pain. 
Um, Chris, what's the expression you use for coders when it's in terms of being able to code a solution? To uh, uh, the quality of the solution depends a hundred percent on how well the coder understands the problem. So right. if if you're a coder and you don't really understand what the heck this thing is going to do, it's going to be some terrible code coming out the other end. Um, yeah. it, it really is important. I know as we were innovating with our clients, I tried to involve our developers or myself directly as much as possible directly with the customer because you could hear their pain. You could really have them explain it to you. And, and the more you talk to them, the more you understood the problem, the better code you were going to write. Yeah. So really important to, uh, to, to approach yeah. it that way. It's, you know, you just, it's pretty intuitive as well. Like, you know, you just, it's hard for you to, you know, I, I don't think I would do a very good job of designing an electric car, but I could do a really good job of talking about how to improve your, now I can anyway, of your on-campus, you know, public safety posture and your mass notification system offerings and all that kind of stuff um, that we were like really involved in for, for, you know, better part of a decade. Um, and so now we come to our fifth principle, um, look for hard problems. I'm going to, I'm going to set this one up, but Chris, I think you're going to sort of kick it through the uprights here. So I think like, do you have a tendency that most founders, most people think of an idea have a tendency to kind of shy away from hard problems. I don't know if I can figure that out. That seems impossible. Da, 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 da. Fair enough. I think there's a few things though to consider here. So first off is that impossible problems are relatively impossible. They're impossible maybe now for a certain reason, um, or but maybe that's changing. Like a good example is the introduction of like AI. All of a sudden AI has opened doors that, and it feels like in like two seconds, but it's opened doors that just weren't available before. How can that technology, how can you use that to you know, maybe change it? Maybe you were taking on an idea before and, and you did think it was impossible, but now you've got a new tool. What about like, you know, and we can see sort of the horizon for a lot of the stuff, you know, quantum computing, computing and, you know, other technologies that are coming down the pike. You know, you wonder, is there, you know, is there a way that I can use something like that to make my previously impossible problem doable? And to that end as well, if you can figure out also something that is currently impossible or perhaps currently not scalable and make it scalable or make it possible, like you'll be a millionaire, no question. And, um, and then it's just a question of a race to the market. <laughs> And, yeah. and a million other little steps in between. So I always think of, I think there's definitely software developers or like CTOs or whatever at our competitors that probably looked at the way that our company was building custom apps for 300, 400 clients and managing all those custom apps in the app stores. And there was somebody in all of our competitors that didn't copy us that, that said to the boss, you know, you can't do that. You know, that that's yeah. too much work. Okay. Yeah. And you know, the reality is we figured out a way to automate it. Most of it, you know, yeah. um, to the point where it was actually really easy to manage all those apps for all those clients. Uh, yeah. We really took a lot of the grunt work out of it. So, um, yeah, it really comes down to something that, uh, everybody would perceive as being unscalable, scale it. And then yeah. you're going to have a lot of success. Yeah. I, I, so I guess if for you and your search for an idea, you should look for hard problems, hard problems, provide unique opportunities for wealth generation, but also to derive value. You know, that's where you're going to do some of the coolest stuff in our society. Um, you know, maybe you'll be, think about Elon Musk and the concept of like landing a rocket. You know, that's, that's pretty cool. And you know, talk about a challenge that felt super impossible that was figured out. So there is, I'm not saying you have to land a rocket, but you, you get the idea. Hard problems provide unique opportunity. And then our sixth and final principle for ideation is understand the market size. So, dear God, do this, girly. For the love of God. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, take it, Chris. You're feeling it. Go for it. So, uh, you know, we, we did stuff in different industries. We tried to build an app that was for newspapers. And, <laughs> like, it, the it, newspaper market was of dollars. <laughs> yeah. Like, literally, there were dozens of dollars to be had. It was such a waste of time. We built an amazing app that was awesome. But we walked, we, we talked to different, we were starting with campus new newspapers at our, our alma mater. And, um, you know, then we, tried to reach it to some of the other newspapers that you know, they just have zero money. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you're, I, it's really tough. Um, and they were just shrinking like the, the revenue dollars were shrinking like crazy. It is such an uphill battle to try and be the savior of an industry in decline or in collapse. Yeah. Stay away from those is, is my advice. Now it's not to say you can't do it, but Oh man, you better have something really amazing. Yeah. It's so much easier to go into a market that's growing. Um, so we were building safety apps. Uh, public safety was, uh, you know, kind of a growth industry. Still is. Uh, still is. I mean, look at Motorola Solutions, yeah. the company that ultimately ended up sort of uh, after a couple of acquisitions buying us. Um, 
like that is a super profitable, enormous company and it's all in public safety. And back in 2010, like building apps wasn't being done. It was brand new. It was yeah. like the growing industry. So all of a sudden now, now when you think about it now, everybody has apps for everything on their phones. Yeah. Um, so that was a really big growth tech that we were we were standing on top of. So even if we were average in the industry, we would be growing because the industry was yeah. growing. Um, yeah. So that, that that's some really big advice that w- we made that mistake a couple of times where we we tried to go into industries that were just in decline. So yeah. Uh, so make sure that the the industry is. Growing growing. Yeah. Make sure the industry's growing. Make sure the market's big enough in general. You know, another thing for us uh, was, you know, we had in universities and colleges, there were probably about 7,000 of them in the United States, a couple hundred more in Canada and, and a few other addressable markets. That's a pretty small market. Um, that's just relatively speaking as compared to like some, you know, other, you know, any B2C market, but for sure. Um, but we made that work. But and what we knew is that, that this part of the market, this public safety element was growing and that these universities and colleges are competitive with each other. So we knew that it was like a good space to enter. So we knew that the, and we knew that they had budgets, you know, those are big organizations that could pay. And so, you know, we made sure that the market was big enough and we made sure that it was a growing market. And then we decided, Hey, let's do this instead of stupid newspapers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> so that's basically it. Those are our six principles. So, uh, be less stressed. So like chill out. You want a lot of ideas, validate the idea, you know, make sure you understand the problem, look for hard problems, um, and understand the market uh, and market size. Um, and as a final note here, folks, go try it, go try yeah. it. There's actually some really cool people on YouTube that do this. You know, they have a weird idea for something and they go and they make it and it's really interesting. Go try it, give it a shot. Um, it will be fun. Hopefully, um, it will be interesting and you'll certainly validate your idea, uh, in a real hurry. Absolutely. Yeah. Go out get it, get your key fingers on the keyboard, uh, build some, for me, it's always you know, write some code, uh, but for whatever you're doing, uh, actually build it and break it and learn from it and keep going. Um, you know, you're going to need like 10 good ideas, uh, to, to kind of get one that actually takes off. So give it a try. And that's it. Boom. Ideation problem solved. Moving on. (laughs) Thanks so much folks. Talk to you next week. Thanks for joining us. If you like what you heard, subscribe to and rate startup different in your favorite podcast app. If you want to see our radio faces, check us out on YouTube at Startup Different and look us up on social. We're probably there if you are. And lastly, do you want to feature your startup on the show? Reach out via our website, startupdifferent.com. See you next time.